and students. Originally, the idea was that I would be a decoration. I've started getting used to the idea of being decorations, especially since a couple of accidents have befallen me. So when Professor Prakash, my teacher, said, you have to be here, Professor Sachidanandan will give the inaugural lecture, and your presence is all that is required. I was quite happy, relieved, to say the least. But then it turns out Professor Sachidanandan is not here. And to boot, I'm not doing too well with my health. So, Kunama Kuru in the Malayalatala Parina, where I was the Anyway, since it has fallen upon me to start the academic sessions, let me plead guilty to the fact that I've not read the Wasteland or the Ulysses recently. In fact, last night when I was thinking, I think the last time I read the Wasteland was nearly seven or eight years back. And, the, and Ulysses, I don't even remember when I read it last. So please don't expect a scholarly uh, lecture from me or even erudite. They are very heavy words. Please avoid those. Okay. There, is, there are very few really erudite people these days amongst us. That's a thing of the past. So please avoid such encomiums. So let me plead guilty to uh, the fact that I will be giving probably a very pedestrian, uh, somewhat common kind of speech, uh, maybe pointing to certain possibilities, especially today when we are looking especially at Wasteland. What do centenaries do? Now, strictly speaking, centenaries have nothing to do with literary sensibility. Centenaries are artificial markers like platinum jubilees, silver jubilees, etc., etc., which have little to do with the literary or the artistic imagination. And as Harris Feinsod so clearly put it, centenaries are empty occasions of calendrical time imposing their false coherence on us. While that may be so, to actually think in terms of years may not be the right way to approach literary texts or literary sensibilities. At the same time, such anniversaries do play a role, especially in helping us think back upon texts, upon literary events, upon literary movements, in a fresh manner, in terms of our own contemporary perspective and experience. So, even though in Feinsod's words, it is calendrical time imposing its false coherence on us, centenaries do serve a purpose, which is exactly what is happening here when we look back upon probably one of the two most important texts in the Western world and also in the rest of the world in terms of their influences, in terms of the resonances that they have brought to other literary cultures, to writers, to critics, and so on and so forth. Not least of which is a presence that these texts had as an intimidating couple of texts in our classrooms. Especially students here will be quite sympathetic to that experience where you have these two texts which do not permit any entry and sometimes what the teachers stand there and say seem not to make any sense whatsoever. It's like 
very difficult proposition altogether. But one interesting thing, especially about the wasteland, centenaries or other anniversaries apart, quite recently wasteland has become uppermost in many literary and cultural discourses, especially during the time of the COVID, the pandemic, and subsequently, I'm not sure whether one should use the word subsequently, subsequently in inverted commas, post-pandemic in inverted commas, Wasteland has been referred to repeatedly. Wasteland has been quoted from extensively. The culture of Wasteland has come up, its echoes have come up in many discourses, in many perorations. Well, that is interesting. Why would it be so? A text written a hundred years back in a vastly, vastly different scenario, in a time when war was primarily hand-to-hand, -hand, fought in trenches with blood and mire and with rotting legs, and where, primarily speaking, conquest was inch by inch, with each inch being at the cost of a human life or more, we live in a vastly different time. And if wasteland is to be understood, as the regular cliches about it go, that it is a poem about the disillusionment of Western man post First World War, the kind of disillusionment that was generated by the loss of lives, the huge destruction, the entirely, shall we say, avoidable, catastrophic implications that the First World War brought in. Why is it that today that echoes with us, that poem resonates with us? That would be an interesting question. Why is it that at the same time there are such resonances from the works of Samuel Beckett? Why is it that along with Eliot, Yeats also seems, seems to be coming up in our imaginaries? In Malayalam alone, there have been five translations of Yeats's poems. The Second Coming by Zinchiam, five translations, two of which have been by Balajandran Chulikad in the last three years. Why the sudden interest in Yeats? Why the sudden interest among theater circles to revive Beckett, not just waiting for Godot, but other plays such as Scrap's Last Tape, Endgame, more importantly. And I'm not talking of the Western world alone, I'm talking of India here, India too here. What is this, if I may use Benjamin's idea, what is it that creates this constellation between us and that time, that sympathetic resonance between us and that time. Now there is an interesting book by Frank Kermod called The Sense of an Ending. That book is primarily about the way in which literature is valuable to human civilization, how literature provides us with a critical perspective on life, how in a certain sense of the term, with the recedence of religion, probably not in a Matthew Arnoldian sense, but in a very contemporary sense, literature provides us with a sense of ethical behavior, moral behavior, the sense of humanity, all of which in one way or another have been challenged, especially in the 1940s, when 
Later on, as Professor Prakash mentioned, 1968, the rise of the Vietnam struggle, the Vietnam War. Kermode wrote this in the 1960s. But there is an, another aspect to that book. One of the major focuses, foci, of his work is the way narratives are structured and how endings are very crucial in narratives. We speak of beginnings, middles, and ends, but seldom do we remember that the beginning and the middle actually acquire their worth, their meaning, and their significance from the end that comes later. If the end changes, the beginning and the middle changes too. Let me give you a small story which Priyanka or some of the others who are my students may have heard from me. A story written by Lord Dunsany. It's a bit of a frivolous story, probably not right to the tenor of Wasteland and Ulysses, but bear with me. Lord Dunsany writes, you've heard of the story of the hare and the tortoise. And then he says, suppose the story didn't end there. Suppose the story continued. And suppose a few days after the race, some of the animals, including the competing, competing, competing uh, hare and the tortoise were together on a little hillock outside the forest of which they were inmates. And while they were playing there, having fun, one of the animals noticed a fire advancing through the valley towards the hillock and the forest. Immediately the animal made a ruckus, all the other animals came together. It was a big fire coming towards the forest. And it would be very dangerous, in fact, it would be catastrophic to all the animals in the forest. So they immediately got together into a meeting and they realized that warning has to be given to the animals in the forest so that they can escape. And then the question is, who shall go to tell the other animals in the forest about the unwatching fire? Well, the choice is clear, obvious. It is a person or the animal which won the race just a few days back. And so the tortoise started. Now what happened after that, we do not know, because no one lived to tell the rest of the story. Ladies and gentlemen, once this ending has changed, the story changes. It's no longer that earlier story where, you know, slow and steady wins the race, etc., etc., such models. Suddenly the story is upset. What you find all through, especially in Indian culture, is this tendency to subvert endings and bring up after stories, mind you, which are not actually sequels, but which are extensions of the ending, which end up in redefining, redetermining, redrawing the very story itself. Uttaragandam is a great example of that in Ramayana. Now, why am I saying this? What Kermode also points out is that in the Western imagination, there is the sense of teleology, of an ending, either a predetermined ending or an ending that is projected from much before and where history is moving in a linear fashion towards that ending. That ending, which could be the last judgment, which could be the flood, which could be the establishment of a communist society, which could be all these projected ends. They provide the rationale for what we are doing now, for our existence now. The end, if it doesn't happen the way we thought it would, think of the number of times that Nostradamus was read recently in the last many years to say that the world's end is here. And then that day comes and passes. Then another day will be taken up as the end 
such an idea of end of ending of a teleology is essential is necessary for a kind of linear historical imagination now that ending which one can also call a sense of apocalypse is probably what we had during the covid times the pandemic times we were faced with the prospect that the way we lived is going to be changed using a yeatsian phrase changed utterly in a manner that it is that in which the previous life was it irretrievable that the civilization the culture the society that we knew of the social fabric the texture that we knew of is going to change irretrievably the word social distancing is probably the greatest indicator of this how can there be social distancing one can understand physical distancing it's an oxymoron of sorts social distancing you can have social proximity but think of social distancing is the social there an adjective or is the social there where the distancing becomes an adjective of the social one doesn't know but in reality what actually happened was a distancing which really really put what one would call a spanner into the wheel of social interaction now this sense of a time coming to an end a culture coming to an end a kind of life coming to an end may probably have been the unconscious reason why we went back to T.S. Eliot and to the wasteland. Because apart from the literary features that you find in the wasteland in terms of, you know, fragmented images, broken images, the form itself, the way in which it challenged conventional notions of poetry and of discourse, apart from all of that, what you find throughout as a compelling obsession is the sense of an ending, an apocalyptic vision. It was not incidental that when the Wasteland was originally written, Eliot had planned to include an epigraph from Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. And that was a phrase by Kratz towards the end of the novel, the horror, the horror. But Ezra Pound wouldn't have any of it and said that that would make the whole thing too weighty as if the removal of that has made it any less weighty. But it gives us an inkling and it has also been very clearly stated that Conrad's Heart of Darkness has been a great presence, a great inspiration for Eliot in his writing of the Baseland. What you find there is an apocalyptic vision in the heart of darkness. You find the same in Yeats. What rough beast, its time come round at last, slouches its way to Bethlehem to be born again. In fact, if you look closely <coughs> at the entirety of Western culture, writing, you find that these intimations of apocalypse, of ending, of the coming to naught of a civilization, the irretrievable destruction of a time is something that happens again and again. Euripides is an instance. After the heights, like the modernist heights, after the heights of Sophocles, and Aeschylus comes Euripides, dark, gloomy. He depicts the war field after the war is over. He depicts not heroes in action, but the implications of the actions of heroes in terms of widows, in terms of orphans, in terms of sisters who have lost their brothers, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> 
Euripides' plays are a Gandhari vilabam in another sense of the term. It takes the veneer of the heroic idiom and makes us look at the ugly, horrible underside of the heroic vision. That heroes are made on the deaths, the killings of a number of others. Probably the greatest, or the most horrendous shall I say, the most horrendous scene that Euripides brings up is the throwing of Asthianax, the one surviving infant of the Trojan family from the ramparts of the Trojan fort. A small child, hardly six months to one year old, killing him. And ho, oh, lo behold, something very similar happened with the last infant leaving from the Tsar's family during the Russian Revolution. History and literature are not mutually exclusive. And it's not literature copying history, most often it is history copying literature. The same kind of gloom you find in Webster, where the glory and the effervescence that you find in Shakespeare or in Johnson or even in Christopher Marlowe comes down to this lone woman whose entire universe is limited to this little circle that comprises herself, her husband and her kids. This little circumference, all discord without, she says. Duchess of Malfi. This intimation of a world coming to an end is constantly there throughout. And it is part of what one could call, in a sense, the Christian vision of its linear movement towards a predetermined end. But what is also of significance and what probably separates Eliot from Yeats is that it is not merely an end that he thinks of and which is where his understanding of anthropology comes to his aid. Much more than the resonances of Indian da 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 or shanti 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 which are there, it is his attempt to discover within the cultural ritualistic life of the West itself a possibility of regeneration of redemption. Now, if you, if you look at it closely, the Jesus myth is another version of the old fertility myths, which is what is clear in Eliot too. And the resurrection is another kind of regeneration. As Shelley says, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? Winter goes to spring. In a sense, I would believe, I would tend to believe that what Eliot was trying to usher in, even within the gloom, the darkness of that post-war period, and the darkness probably of his own life, different from, say, Samuel Beckett, who says, they give birth astride of a grave, one moment you are born, another moment you die, there is a pause in between. And you ask the meaning of that? They give birth astride of a grave. Giving birth astride of a grave where the womb and the grave, birth and death are brought together, coalesced, merged. And the tension between death and the possibility of a rebirth, the tension between an ending and the possibility of a new beginning is what you find in Eliot, I would tend to believe. And that is what has held its charm for over a century or for a century. And it speaks to us today in the post-pandemic period where after being 
through three years of the worst kind of anti-social life that one can imagine and where one had resigned oneself to that kind of life probably for an indeterminate future. The small, little, tiny gleams of hope that are part of a cyclical sense of time rather than a linear sense of time that nothing ends that there is always a start a beginning after an end is probably what charms us today with Eliot's work I'm not going to speak about Ulysses there are people who are going to hear, be here and even this is just a few observations nothing more let me stop here uh, Thank you very much. Thank you.